Thank you so much. So good morning to everybody and thank you so much for making the effort of being here early this morning, even if it's the last day. And uh, um, so um, today I would like to talk a bit about uh, cosmochemistry and somehow try to link uh, the interest uh, that uh, I personally have on planets and in particular atmosphere on planets uh, to the bigger picture. And starting about the bigger picture, if we're looking at the abundances of the chemical elements uh, in the universe today, um, well, of course, the most uh, uh, abundant element is hydrogen. Um, the uh, abundance is basically a scaled, so you can see the H is really very big compared to all the others. And that gives immediately the strong message that, in fact, hydrogen is really uh, 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 by order of magnitude uh, more abundant than the others. A bit of helium and then of course uh, the abundance has decreased quite a lot. Here you have uh, the right number. You can see that uh, already for carbon and nitrogen uh, we immediately go down to 10 to the minus 4. Um, so the understanding of the origin of the chemical elements and their abundances uh, really goes back uh, to uh, some uh, really key works, uh, um, for instance, this particular paper, Alpha, uh, uh, Beefy, and Gamov. Um, uh, the the story actually is quite uh, is quite interesting because uh, Alpha and Gamov were supposed to publish this paper, but then they thought that uh, uh, having a paper with authors Alpha, uh, uh, Beefy, and Gamov was really quite intriguing because of the letters and so they invited BC uh, to co-sign the paper. And so as you can see already uh, back there uh, in uh, back then in, in 1948 uh, uh, the understanding of uh, how the chemical abundance should look like was uh, was already pretty good. Um, clearly all this was also uh, in part understood by the work of uh, Fred Hoyle and Heddington. So what we're talking about here is actually nucleosynthesis, and uh, we know today that uh, um, there are some elements that really were formed or in the first three minutes of the Big Bang. Um, and in particular, uh, uh, hydrogen and deuterium, uh, these are certainly elements that were are produced uh, during these three minutes. Uh, the over H uh, is a relatively a fragile isotope, um, but um, certainly again uh, it was mainly produced during this uh, this period, and so it is uh, some of the isotope of uh, helium, um, and in part also lithium. So again, uh, the uh, lighter elements, uh, lighter chemi chemical elements, were already produced basically after the uh, 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 first three minutes of the Big Bang. Now, the, uh, uh, the specific um, uh, elemental abundances have been improved through, through time, and in particular after the uh, emission plank, these, uh, these numbers have been revised, because of course the calculation of, of these uh, concentrations depend on some of the cosmological uh, constants that have been refined through Planck. So actually, this is a relatively recent paper that is basically uh, revisiting some of these uh, ratio, dual uh, lithium and helium, <coughs> um, uh, beryllium, uh, uh, looking basically at the primordial abundances uh, uh, after the Planck mission. There's a twist on this that there could have been some first tra uh, phase transition first order and then the beryllium and Berk were observed also, the beryllium and Berk, what are they called? Boron. Boron. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and I think that the, the important, uh, amazing importance of this, that this determines also the beryllium mass with all the implications about the missing uh, dark matter, etc. Absolutely. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, Thanks to again mission like Planck and before Planck W map, uh, it looks like now these numbers are getting more and more precise, and so we have uh, a solid uh, starting point. 
Uh, well, uh, lithium actually uh, uh, also is, uh, um, it, it, it's a bit fragile in the sense that it was a bit produced uh, during the uh, first three minutes, but was not really so abundant. And then uh, to a degree is not really produced too much uh, in stars. And so lithium beryllium actually have a sort of a minimum, I will show you a figure where you have the relative abundances plotted in the same graph and you can see that uh, they are a bit like uh, in a minimum because they were a little bit produced by the Big Bang but not in high abundances and somehow they are not really produced so much by, uh, by stars and so they end up not being very, um, very abundant. Exactly. So there are, there are several mechanisms but uh, uh, overall um, that's why actually these numbers are so small. Well, I don't know all the details, to be completely uh, sincere, uh, but uh, certainly is not one of those elements that uh, is being produced, and so that's why uh, it has uh, uh, such a small number. So apart from uh, understanding nucleosynthesis from Big Bang and looking at uh, what we know today about the Big Bang, and so through cosmology, there is another way, basically, to try to uh, understand this very early concentration in the universe, and it's trying to look at the uh, all the stars. So, the uh, of course, uh, possibly, one would like to really observe the first generation of star. Now, it looks like uh, um, very rec quite recently they have uh, discovered this star that uh, is in the galactic uh, halo of our galaxy. Um, the name is HD140283, and it seems to be really very old. In fact, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, it's very, very metal poor. Uh, it has been classified as extreme population two, which means it is not really the first generation, but it's almost immediately after. And uh, the, the age uh, uh, is basically the age of the Big Bang uh, with some error bar. So, of course, it cannot have been formed really before the Big Bang, uh, and that's why there is an error bar. But uh, this is just to say that uh, at the moment it's one of the oldest objects uh, that are known, and that's why it has been um, baptized in that way. Um, so again, uh, the study of uh, this particular star and the similar star give us a hint also about uh, these uh, uh, concentrations, and in particular lithium is one of those elements that is studied. Uh, uh, also in this way. So I told you that uh, I, I, I wanted in fact to get there. Um, we have uh, basically three population, population one, two and three. Population three is the one that I want to talk about right now, is basically the first generation of stars. And uh, we're talking about almost zero metallicity sort of star over than lithium. So basically it's really the first star that formed immediately after Big Bang. So we're talking about uh, 10 power 6, 10 power 7 uh, uh, years um, uh, after the Big Bang. So this star no longer exists, but certainly they affected quite uh, deeply the environment of the early universe. Um, without metal, you cannot really cool off um, the um, the universe just hydrogen is not really a very good cooler um, and so they they form from the primordial sort of molecular clouds uh, again since there were no metals no dust grain there is very little or no no cooling in this sort of population three stars um, what is supposed to be the mass of these objects is unclear because of course uh, being the first generation, potentially you can create uh, uh, very massive objects, and so the suggestion is even going up to 1,000 uh, solar masses. Um, well, I guess is a model of star formation. Um, so, how you can uh, um, how you can basically uh, do effectively some star formation in those uh, early conditions. 
I agree. So it's, it's not really <laughs> something, but these are the kind of debates that there is in the literature. Um, Well, in fact, uh, I want to get there as well, because there are some claims of population three stars uh, that are very recent. Uh, they found uh, an object that uh, goes back to a redshift of, of z equals six that they claim is, uh, is one of these objects. Whether the claim will be uh, confirmed or not uh, is, is to be seen, but certainly, uh, at least until this, this year, this is a very recent claim, uh, there seem to be no objects uh, 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 for population three. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, of course, this first generation uh, had uh, basically almost exploded immediately after the formation, uh, especially if they had uh, such uh, masses. Um, and uh, uh, after this explosion, uh, through su supernova type of explosion, uh, they uh, released the, the metals that they were formed uh, in this very short-lived sort of uh, a star. Um, and uh, because of the release of these uh, metals, uh, then the universe uh, could start to cool. Um, in fact, uh, hydrogen is a very bad cooler. The reason for that, you might remember that when we discussed this spectroscopy of molecule, I told you that molecule like H2 or N2 uh, they don't have any dipole, um, and so because of that, uh, they don't, uh, um, they're not really good cooler because they don't really have uh, uh, so many transition to uh, help cooling off. Yes? Yes. Uh, yes, well, the, the, the point is, well, first of all, I should have mentioned that here I'm using uh, uh, the word metal in an astronomy sense. Uh, for astronomers, uh, a metal is anything that is non hydrogen. And so uh, uh, I should, uh, first of all, say that. Um, and in general, a molecule that can absorb or emit photons in the infrared can basically either cool or warm up, depending if you're, uh, I for, for instance, for a planetary atmosphere, if you absorb some photons which are emitted by the surface of the planet, you're effectively warming up the planet because you're retaining a radiation uh, that is in the planet, and so you're uh, um, sort of stopping the planet to cool off uh, more efficiently as a black body. In some other cases, the fact that you have a transition in the infrared it means that you can emit photons, and so you can basically release heat through the emission. So depending on the situation, uh, the, the point is you need to have some transition in the infrared in order to uh, uh, release some of this uh, heat. Uh, well, collision-induced uh, certainly is a possibility if you have really a very high pressure uh, of a particular molecule. So H2, if you, if you have a pressure of one bar or more, then you have uh, collision-induced transitions. Uh, but more in general, um, uh, if, if you look at the transition also for vibration or rotation, uh, they also can help uh, basically cooling off. And my point is that in this particular case, A2 just has a, tran a quadrupole transition at 70 micron, not a dipole, so it's not really a very good cooler because of this, uh, symmetric, uh, the symmetry of the molecule. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, there has been a claim on observation of population 3 star uh, at high redshift. And certainly, this is one of the main goals of JWST, sort of finding a population three stars and pushing observation towards very high redshifts. Okay. So, um, to come back to your question, Rem, sorry, it's a bit stuck. Um, 
population, uh, extreme population two, is uh, the generation that is immediately after the population three. So they're not the first generation, but they're still very, very old. And so they can, uh, they still have a very low metallicity and they should uh, uh, have a, a good information about what was the uh, chemical environment when they form. So that's why objects like the one they show before are interesting one because they could be a fossil of what, what happened in that, uh, in that period. Okay, so um, talking about supernovae, um, of course if we have uh, very big objects, uh, very big stars, uh, uh, at the end of their life they explode as a supernovae. And when they do that, basically, that's how you release uh, some of the metals that were formed originally in the star to the interstellar medium. Um, so we're talking about uh, an explosion that uh, can last a fraction of a second and can span typically for about a parsec. This is just to give you an idea when this uh, explosion occurs, uh, how the material is uh, uh, released uh, to the rest of the medium. Um, they can uh, keep expanding for a million years um, and uh, uh, the reason we know uh, a lot of this information is because when they uh, explode they, they, they create a bow shock with the interstellar medium and that creates some x-rays that then uh, can be um, detected, they can be measured. Uh, the rate of explosion is about 2 per century um, and uh, we are counting about of the order of 100 supernova in the Milky Way. Um, we haven't detected any supernova coming from uh, population 3, but there are some uh, population 2 supernova that have been detected as the uh, uh, about 2. So I'll show you a picture. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Well, uh, there are, I guess, some other one. I'm not necessarily a super expert or supernova, but. Uh, 87 was, but it was not in the galaxy. So, so maybe you're so right. <laughs> maybe you're, I would have imagined there was uh, another one, but. Uh. So this is just. There will be one this year. There will be two this year. Okay. <laughs> just to make up with the statistics, <laughs> yes. So <laughs> so um, I'm sure you hear just uh, uh, the uh, beautiful image of uh, a supernova just to make the point of um, the kind of uh, signal that they create uh, and they can be and, and can be detected. So I told you I told you about population three about population two, but then we also have uh, uh, population one stars, and these are the the younger object. Uh, and because they are younger objects, they have the highest metallicity. Um, in uh, the Milky Way, the very, very, uh, the, 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 the younger one uh, of the population one are located more towards the galactic bulge. And then population one, slightly less recent, is on the contrary more in the external branch like uh, the sun. Uh, and the sun, in fact, is an example of population one but is uh, in the spiral arms, and so is not really among uh, the youngest object. Now, what is interesting is that given that uh, these uh, population one stars that have high metallicity, is uh, to uh, um, compare um, and uh, try to correlate basically the metallicity of the stars with the presence of, uh, of planets. And this has been done in the past, uh, and uh, in the past in particular, uh, uh, there has been uh, um, uh, a lot of work being done in the literature to compare, for instance, uh, 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 giant planets, uh, uh, the presence of giant planets with the metallicity of the star. And uh, uh, earlier work seemed to suggest uh, that uh, uh, you could have uh, giant planets uh, uh, if the metallicity was relatively high. And so there was a strong correlation between the presence of giant planets around the stars 
and the metallicity of the star. More recent work that has been done thanks to the Kepler statistics, um, then uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the result is quite interesting. So we're looking here uh, uh, basically at the metallicity uh, of uh, um, uh, 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 two types of uh, uh, population one, so relatively uh, high uh, uh, metallicity sort of stars. Um, and in this diagram, we see the radius of the planet uh, compared with the metallicity. And as you can see, while uh, it is true, these results are confirming the fact that when you go for uh, a bigger planet, a giant one, then you need to have a relatively high metallicity for the star. Actually, when uh, you look at relatively small objects, uh, it looks like you don't really need to have such high metallicity. And so actually it looks like terrestrial type objects or smaller objects um, uh, do not really need to have such a high metallicity. And this is clearly a very important result. So the kind of transition is already visible when you start to uh, push from the giant uh, towards the Neptune. Yes? Well, this result uh, is basically just correlating stars that were looked at by Kepler uh, with the planets discovered by Kepler. And so that's where uh, this diagram is coming from. But this result seems to suggest that, uh, yes, uh, 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 presumably I would imagine that when you form a core of a giant planet, uh, you need much more material. And that's why then uh, you need to have relatively high metallicity of the star in order to form a giant planet, whereas the amount of mass uh, that you need to form terrestrial planet is, is much less. And presumably that's why actually this correlation um, uh, doesn't really work in the case of terrestrial planets. But maybe Dave or somebody else has uh, a better explanation. So I realized that I missed one slide, and in fact I missed this particular slide. This, this slide is interesting because what we're looking at here is how all the elements of the periodic table are formed. And uh, as you can see here, the color code uh, 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 tell us that uh, in violet you have, uh, in purple you have uh, basically the elements that were formed during the Big Bang. Uh, then we have uh, small stars. Uh, so the elements that uh, have been produced, on the contrary, uh, as uh, nucleosynthesis inside the, <coughs> the stars, uh, and in particular small stars, are in yellow. And so these are, in particular, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, up to sulfur. Um, then uh, in green, basically, are elements uh, that were formed uh, in the core of larger stars. And then uh, beyond the iron, uh, then uh, you usually need to have supernovae in order to produce uh, um, uh, these high metals. And this is because, as, we, as I will show you in a bit, uh, uh, then uh, it becomes energetically um, 
inconvenient uh, to produce beyond uh, uh, iron um, uh, elements which are heavier than iron through um, uh, fusion. Yeah. Uh, small and, and larger is just the size of the star. So for small, I mean uh, G, F, a K sort of stars. Supernova basically it means that uh, is uh, during the supernova explosion that basically you create this material because the ball shock, for instance, is very intense uh, and then the temperature is very high and so in that moment in time you're creating um, some high Z element. On the contrary, in the case of large star and small star, I'm talking about what is being produced uh, in the core of the star for fusion. So can you repeat the question? So there's claims that some of the elements, I think, mm -hmm. uh, the Z higher than uh, silver or gold, were created. Domi the, do the dominant creation mechanism is by merging of neutron stars. Mm -hmm. So I was wonder wondering where it fits into the. Uh, um, good point. I'm not really too familiar with this. So. so uh, uh, When we start, the, the, I know very little about it, but from, from the little I know, mm -hmm. we start the, the, the trick there is that you start with a uh, very dense um, nuclear matter, and we, when you, they come at the explosion, and some of them that they really do the opposite, and they start to conform very high, 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 high the elements. But they stay under much. No, no. Okay, so let me come back to metallicity. Okay, so as you can see here, this is sort of the cycle uh, uh, of element. Uh, we sort of star start from a, a dense molecular cloud, then you form the protostar uh, uh, with a disk, then you form planetary system. At a certain point, this planetary system uh, uh, in particular the star uh, evolve and uh, when the star is dying through a supernova and different mechanism basically uh, the material that uh, were produced are released again in the interstellar medium and so there is a sort of a cycle um, uh, of elements so in fact focus, focusing a bit uh, in uh, um, molecular clouds uh, molecular clouds are um, just wait a sec because I have a different slide. Yeah. Molecular clouds are, are basically some uh, region of the interstellar medium where basically the temperature is particularly cold and uh, the number of particles uh, in a centimeter cube uh, is between 10 power 4 and 10 power 6. So uh, the concentration, the density is certainly higher compared to other part of the interstellar medium where, on the contrary, the gas is ionized and even more rarefied. Uh, but still, uh, you need to compare 10 power 4, 10 power 6 to uh, 10 power 19, more or less, of particle in a centimeter cube that we have uh, uh, here in this room. So clearly, we are still talking about relatively uh, small concentration. And being so cold, of course, these molecular clouds, the kind of reactions uh, that can occur in the molecular clouds are chemical reaction are very s uh, very uh, slow because of course the the time for collision is very slow um, due to this uh, uh, low temperature and also low concentration. So molecular clouds are part of the interstellar medium that is particularly interesting uh, because uh, that's uh, that's basically the starting point for the star formation. Um, 
in particular, what happens uh, uh, is that uh, if there is a critical mass for the molecular clouds, uh, that uh, the uh, you start an implosion, and so uh, the implosion can trigger uh, the formation of a protostar, um, uh, and so uh, clearly molecular clouds are the uh, a, a potential uh, nursery of uh, star forming region. Um, the fact that uh, they are so uh, dark, as you can see here, this is an image in the visible, they are so dark uh, because uh, apart from uh, 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 some gas, and in particular uh, uh, the gas present is mostly molecular hydrogen and CO and then our, um, uh, our molecules, but so they are also uh, many uh, uh, dust particles, which are very small, um, and these dust, par dust particles basically uh, are the ones that are creating this opacity, and uh, that's why they look really so dark. Um, typically, we're talking about a dust to gas uh, ratio of uh, 1 over 100. Uh, some of these molecular clouds, when you look at them in the infrared, uh, they might show us that uh, behind them uh, there is a, a star that is forming. And uh, in fact, in this particular uh, picture here, you see the image in the visible and then an image in the infrared taken with Spitzer. And as you can see, there is a, a protostar that is, uh, uh, is in the process of forming uh, in this uh, molecular cloud. Uh, there is another image um, on, uh, taken with Hubble. Again, in the visible, uh, these uh, small dust particles can create uh, uh, opacity, and so it's very hard to see through the dust. But if you look in, in the infrared, uh, then you can see um, uh, many stars that are forming in this particular region. And certainly, uh, not just Hubble, but also Spitzer, and in particular, Herschel uh, telescope have provided really uh, great imaging uh, images and data about star forming region. Herschel in particular was looking at uh, uh, very far in the infrared, so relative very good to looking at cold dust, uh, um, and uh, so many star forming region have been looked at uh, um, uh, with Herschel. Uh, of course, the after uh, a star is forming, uh, the material around the star is, uh, is much hotter, much more ionized, and so it's clearly not the same uh, uh, composition and density compared to the uh, molecular cloud. And uh, on top of that, when uh, the star in is a uh, uh, T-Tauri phase, uh, the star can be really very bright uh, in the uh, X-ray part of the spectrum. And in particular, I'm showing you here uh, an observation that uh, was taken for, the, uh, for Orion. Uh, as you can see from this picture, we're looking at here um, at a, a massive flare in the X-ray uh, with the, um, well, the typical crescent luminosity in uh, X-rays for the Sun um, is about uh, um, uh, one million of uh, um, Kelvin. Um, and this is the question part. Um, basically, the question luminosity for uh, some of these uh, um, T tauri can be about uh, 1,000 times uh, bigger than the one on the Sun. And the very intense flare, uh, as you can see here, can reach uh, 5,000 uh, 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 million uh, Kelvin. So. Um, Clearly, when you have uh, these very strong uh, flares, um, in particular in this article, uh, I'm sorry I haven't put the, the reference, I noticed it's Favat et al. 2012, 2005, sorry. Um, you're creating basically some uh, uh, coronal arch that are connecting the T Tauri with the disk. Um, and so, as you can imagine, uh, uh, this are has a, a potential, a important implication on the photochemistry in the disk. Yeah, the ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> in the X-rays, or uh, <laughs> this was done with Chandra. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I would, yeah. Mm. Oh yes, very strong. In fact, uh, that's, that's how they, they sort of suggest in the article that there must be some sort of magnetic connection between the T-Tauri and the disk. So, um, coming back to the interstellar medium, so we'll look at... Uh, uh, what is happening when we're looking at molecular clouds and what is happening when, on the contrary, we're looking at a star-forming region. Um, in general, in the interstellar me medium, sorry, the gas phase uh, um, uh, has uh, several reactions uh, uh, and uh, I'm in this table and just show you some of them. I really don't want to go through um, all these reactions, but this is just to show you that uh, there are several processes of photoionization, photodissociation, um, and so there is a, a quite complex uh, sort of chemistry going on. Um, so what is triggering really all this chemistry? Because we have discussed in particular that when it comes to molecular clouds, we're talking about a very cold environment uh, uh, and uh, with, a, uh, I mean, the the density is relatively low. So what, uh, what is triggering uh, this chemistry? Uh, so there are two, uh, two main uh, uh, elements that are actually triggering uh, the uh, interesting chemistry in the interstellar medium. One is basically uh, the, um, the chemistry is basically sort of activated by cosmic, uh, cosmic rays uh, or by UV photons that are coming from uh, uh, stars. Um, but another way actually to uh, trigger the chemistry is a chemistry uh, basically um, uh, catalyzed by the presence of uh, ice and dust grains, especially in these uh, uh, molecular clouds. And so basically reactions that would be way too small to happen because of the uh, very small number of collisions between molecules, uh, given the temperature and the low density, actually can happen and they're really triggered because of this presence of this uh, small particle of dust. And uh, there, has there have been uh, a lot of progresses made by lab measurements uh, during the past years really to show that indeed uh, this is possible. Uh, and this is because uh, uh, somehow when the first result uh, uh, of this interesting molecule in the interstellar median uh, became known, this was a chemistry that was not entirely understood. Uh, the conditions uh, are very different from the sort of condition in lab, and so you really need to recreate uh, this sort of condition to understand uh, how it's possible to form uh, this molecule through this mechanism. Not only molecules like CO or water or ammonia or CO2 are formed, actually very long uh, chain of molecules can be formed in this way because of the um, uh, help uh, of this uh, uh, dust grain. What I'm showing you here is actually an out-of-date, I should say, list of molecules that have been detected in the interstellar <coughs> medium and star formation region. The reason why I didn't put the, the most updated one is that there was no space in just one slide. Um, but uh, uh, actually, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, many uh, uh, very uh, complex and long chain molecules with several atoms have been uh, discovered uh, uh, in the interstellar medium. And many of these molecules actually are sort of prebiotic, uh, prebiotic precursors. So um, uh, it's a very interesting chemistry. And again, it wouldn't be possible to form this very long chain and this very complex molecule if it weren't really for the uh, help of this dust grain. So we talked about uh, the molecular cloud. And uh, I'm sure you, you did in some other um, lectures in this, in this school, uh, the nebula theory. Can you confirm it is the case? Somebody talked about uh, nebula theory, and I would imagine so. Star formation and 
Well, I can go through this uh, very quickly. Okay, okay. So what happened is basically you start with this uh, molecular cloud and then if there is something that is triggered, some sort of uh, disequilibrium and you have a critical mass, uh, uh, then uh, you can potentially start to implode. And uh, if the implosion uh, sort of cause a raise in the temperature at the center of the molecular cloud, uh, uh, at a certain point, uh, basically, you can start to form a protostar uh, in the center of uh, your molecular cloud. This protostar, for uh, some time, will not really necessarily enter the main sequence. Um, but uh, in it, so during the T-Tauri phase, um, you're not yet in the main sequence, and so most of the energy radiated is a sort of gravitational energy. Um, in the meantime, the material that is around the star uh, start to flatten out because of the, rota the rotation in a disk. And that's how then you can start to, uh, uh, to form a planet while uh, uh, your star at the center, if it has uh, enough uh, mass, uh, will uh, uh, enter um, the main sequence. And so all this sort of mechanism of star and uh, planet formation is uh, known as nebula theory. So once we are at the level of a disk and potentially a planetary system, uh, now we are looking basically at the abundances of uh, chemical elements uh, in the solar system. Um, as you can see, for the solar system, we have, uh, again, uh, hydrogen that is uh, very abundant, and then immediately helium, lithium, and beryllium are, on the contrary, at the minimum. And another peak is iron, because uh, actually um, it's, um, it's where basically um, uh, iron can be formed uh, uh, both through uh, supernovae, but also uh, a, a as a nucleosynthesis, as fusion in, in, uh, in stars. And so that's why actually iron is, uh, um, is uh, quite abundant. Now, what is interesting is that uh, the, um, the chemical abundances of these elements, um, if, uh, if we plot, basically, if you look at the measurements uh, of uh, um, chemical elements in carbonaceous chondrites, uh, and we compare them with the, uh, the one uh, in the soil atmosphere, actually, there is a very strong correlation. And so, basically, this tells us this, uh, carbonaceous chondrites are actually a very good uh, uh, measurement uh, apart from the presence of hydrogen, but for all the other elements are a very good measurement uh, of uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, solar system sort of uh, um, elemental composition. So coming back to the disk, uh, before basically planets uh, are formed or why they're formed, uh, of course, we're talking about a disk that is still <laughs> quite hot, and in particular, is very hot in the um, in the part that are close to the star. And so, at the uh, very high temperature uh, close to the star, a uh, temperature uh, uh, hotter than 1,500 Kelvin, uh, that's where we get mostly uh, refractory sort of elements. Um, and uh, on the contrary, as soon as uh, the temperature starts to be uh, colder, uh, far away from the star, uh, that's where we have uh, metals like uh, nickel and iron, uh, or, al or also magnesium silicates, sort of uh, minerals. And then the more we're going far away from the star, the more uh, um, minerals uh, uh, that uh, condense basically a temperature of 500 or, or, or sorry 400 or 500 and so um, uh, uh, sort of more volatile type of element more hydrating minerals then they can form um, and uh, we can start to have a high cis uh, at temperature between 200 and uh, 50 uh, Kelvin um, and of course it depends if we're talking about uh, high cis uh, um, uh, of water or methane <coughs> or ammonia. So 
we basically have a sort of situation where uh, very close to the uh, star where the temperature is few uh, thousands of Kelvin, uh, basically we have a situation where no solid grain can really condense uh, between 0.2 and 3 astronomical units. Here I imagine a, a star similar to the sun uh, for the astronomical units. Um, at less than 2,000 Kelvin is where we can start to form uh, uh, metals. And then between uh, 5 and 30 astronomical units, that's where then we can start to form uh, uh, high seas uh, and uh, um, in particular water, ammonia or methane ices. Um, so clearly in this model that is looking at the uh, equilibrium chemistry of the disk, uh, uh, we, we sort of have that the more volatile material needs to be present in a larger distance to the star, whereas the more refractive one needs to be, uh, I mean, uh, can be produced very close to the star. And so clearly this gives a sort of initial condition of where the material is located, and so clearly this uh, can influence what is then the composition of the planets that will form, yes. In fact, uh, I'm not suggesting that then the planet form in situ. I'm just saying that normally in equilibrium chemistry, this is how the material is disposed. Yeah, so and in fact, when it comes to... For the giant planets? Yeah. Well, the, the hot Jupiter, in fact, uh, uh, is uh, is forming the outer region of the of, of the disk where you have most of the ices and also most of the gas. Uh, you need to have still a lot there, of. There have been a couple of recent suggestions. This one that was my point. I'm, 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 I'm in situ, you mean? Sorry, you mean close to the star? I okay. But where, uh, I mean, how can you still accrete a lot of uh, hydrogen? Because hydrogen is quite volatile, and so so close to the star uh, uh, seems to me not, not uh, obvious <coughs> how you can do that. Question. Yeah? Is, doesn't it also depend on the density? If we, you should only show a condition of the temperature. Mm -hmm. But isn't the density a factor? I would imagine that if it's too tenuous, then yeah, of course. I mean, uh, well, there is well always the, the pressure and the, and the temperature. Uh, uh, you need also to look at the pressure, of course. But this is just to give you some guidelines of what are the sort of temperature at which some uh, phase transition can occur. Yeah. I'm really curious about, um, about the inner region of the nebula. Um, there are these calcium aluminum rich inclusions, and they have to meet to condense them immediately out of the gas. So, so they, I mean, they believe to form really close in, right? Well, they can certainly uh, be relatively close, those, those materials, yes. And there's, I mean, they're solid, so... Yes. Uh, I mean, they need to be, like, within, within that region, within, like, the fraction of the region. Again, this is quite indicative, so don't take this, uh, you, you know, really. With yes, please. So, um, so in molecular clouds, people sometimes have yeah, told about story of self-shielding, that is the outer layer of molecules to protect things in the interior of molecules from being destroyed from um, starlight, from asteroids. So I'm just wondering whether kind of similar self-shielding process have been this is a very simple argument. Yeah. This is just showing you, uh, uh, as a function of temperature and distance to the star, what are at the equilibrium yeah. the most obvious material that you can think of. Of course, the situation is more complicated and. Of their 
I am not aware of, but doesn't mean I, I don't necessarily work uh, specifically on this uh, on this topic. So maybe somebody in the audience might have a better idea about this. Well, certainly there are more and more lab experiments that are trying to look at the chemistry at the uh, particular uh, thermodynamical environments that uh, can be useful for this sort of. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that so the knowledge is uh, is complete. <laughs> Okay, well, certainly the situation is much more complicated in the, this chemistry, um, in part because, as I said before, uh, uh, the star uh, has a very, um, is, is very active in X-ray or, or UV photons in this, uh, uh, in this moment in time, and so clearly uh, there, this is triggering uh, also other uh, uh, photochemical reactions. What is uh, uh, interesting, though, is that uh, thanks to observatories like Herschel, uh, but in particular ALMA at the moment, uh, more and more the chemistry of the disks uh, uh, are being studied in great detail. Um, and so uh, uh, the understanding of what's really going on and all the intricacies uh, is, uh, is getting uh, more clear. Um, in particular, during the uh, past years, uh, um, spectroscopy has been made uh, for uh, uh, many of these uh, disks, and these, for instance, are some results uh, from uh, Herschel, um, where cold water was detecting basically uh, enveloping a sort of uh, uh, a dusty disk around a young star, uh, and so clearly this kind of measurement. Uh, uh, tell us about uh, the distribution of uh, water vapor in particular in these disks. A lot of measurements were taken with, uh, with Herschel to track water uh, in the disk and in the interstellar medium. But also um, high cis in protoplanetary disks uh, were observed again uh, through uh, Herschel or Spitzer in the infrared. Um, uh, and uh, this is certainly uh, extremely interesting information because depending where the ice line can form, uh, then uh, 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 as we will see uh, in, a, in a few slides, uh, that can determine quite a lot the chemistry of the planet that is forming. And so uh, understanding better the ice line and what are the, um, the, the typical ices that can form and, and where in this they can form is, is certainly extremely useful information. So, um, coming back to planets, somehow, so already formed the planet. Um, today we have about 2,000 planets that have been discovered in our galaxy. And uh, as you have heard uh, all through uh, the school, uh, the uh, parameters, even very simple parameters like distance to the star or planetary mass and size, uh, are really uh, have very little resemblance with the solar system sort of planets. And so this suggests that there is a, a huge variety, a huge diversity of planets out there. And uh, we really want to try to understand this diversity. Where does it come from? Uh, and uh, what can we say about this planet that seems, at least on paper, so different from the planets in our own solar system? <coughs> 
And so I already showed you the slides uh, uh, in my very first lecture, and so I'm coming back to this because this is uh, uh, what I want to discuss for the, for the rest uh, uh, of my lecture. Uh, studying exoplanetary atmosphere uh, is interesting because through the atmospheric composition we can potentially link uh, the current situation with the planet uh, uh, with the formation process uh, but also with the, uh, all the sort of physical and uh, chemical processes that uh, 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 trigger the evolution also of, uh, of the planet. And so processes like uh, escape, uh, uh, how gassing, condensation, uh, uh, interaction with the star, even the presence of life, are all uh, um, uh, uh, physical and chemical processes that can uh, uh, dramatically change the composition of the atmosphere. And hopefully, by studying many uh, exoplanetary atmosphere, we can try to understand all these processes uh, and uh, 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 draw some conclusion about the big picture. Um, Forget and uh, Lecomte, uh, François Forget and Jeremy Lecomte, uh, have published an interesting paper uh, a couple of years ago uh, where they sort of tried to, uh, uh, to predict what are the uh, most probable uh, atmospheric composition uh, for planets according to uh, uh, two parameters, two simple parameters, the temperature and the planetary mass. So this is... Uh, sort of the equivalent for planets of a nature diagram. Um, and what they did was to look at uh, all the chemical and physical processes that are known for a solar system object and try to extrapolate from what we know from the solar system uh, uh, to what should potentially happen uh, to this exosolar planet. And so when you change uh, even this, this two simple parameter, then you start to... Um, uh, to, to have uh, some sort of uh, different domain uh, in this diagram uh, where, for instance, uh, 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 we have uh, the uh, giant planets uh, uh, which are typically uh, very massive uh, and because of that they retain a lot of hydrogen and helium and so it makes sense to predict that their atmosphere is mainly made of hydrogen and helium and they can be relatively stable until relatively high temperature. Uh, of course, the mass loss uh, then, then will start, but for a massive object, this process is much less efficient than from a, a for a small one. Uh, objects that have temperature similar to the Earth, uh, so more terrestrial type of objects, presumably they, they can have uh, an atmosphere similar to the terrestrial planets in our own solar system, so with atmosphere that are mainly made of CO2 or uh, molecular nitrogen, uh, uh, water vapor. Um, then, of course, there are some transitions between these different domains in the diagram. Where this transition really occurs, <coughs> this needs to be really constrained by observations. Uh, so uh, they, of course, decline to um, uh, somehow to fix this transition zone in a, in a, in a theoretical way. But the idea here is that uh, if... Uh, if uh, you consider temperature that are towards the temperature of Venus at a certain point, uh, uh, there is a runaway greenhouse effect, uh, like uh, potentially happened on Venus, that will at a certain point uh, uh, cause uh, water to be lost to space because you're evaporating water up to the uh, upper atmosphere and then water can be photolyzed and uh, uh, for a uh, not very massive uh, planet, hydrogen can escape uh, um, to space. Um, and then on the contrary, if you are uh, 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 colder at a certain point, so if you go towards colder temperature, at a certain point CO2 might collapse, uh, and it means that the chemical composition of the atmosphere, your terrestrial planet, uh, uh, will, be, uh, would don't, will not have clearly CO2, but more CO and CH4. Um, Looking at uh, uh, very high temperature but uh, relatively small objects, so more silicate type of planets, and then at a certain point the silicate at the surface can evaporate. <coughs> and so one might think of objects where um, uh, uh, 
literally the, 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 the surface uh, is, uh, is molten and where uh, uh, we, can, we can find uh, some silicates uh, uh, in a volatile form in the atmosphere, and so on and so forth. So clearly this is a prediction and uh, we need to have observation to understand uh, uh, whether all this domain and all this transition makes sense, but this is uh, a sort of starting point. To, to me, diagrams like this arise yeah. because people like to think of diagrams on planet. And it doesn't actually make sense because what people are doing when they draw a diagram like this is they are insisting as a boundary condition that there are only two primary parameters. And in, in the case of planets, I just don't think that's right. Uh, I think it's a mistake, a conceptual mistake. And I'll give you two examples. Mm -hmm. Water. Uh, in the case of water, the amount of water that is delivered to the Earth is, can, can vary hugely depend on the, depending on the assumptions you make about how you put the planetary system together by orders of magnitude. The question of whether you have CO2 is not at all clear. People often focus on CO2 because we have it in our solar system. And of course, as you mentioned, you do see it in, in other disks, but it's not obvious that that's the main speciation of carbon. Uh, things like that make me very suspicious of this kind of diagram. Uh, I'm not criticizing the authors. I like these guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. but, but I do think it's, a, uh, it's an overreach. Well, to, to be fair, uh, they are the first one being very critical about this diagram, but uh, they, they sort of uh, summarize uh, uh, what they, they kind of extrapolate out of the solar system uh, as, a, as, as a way to provoke discussion yeah. about this object. So not really just to say this is the prediction. So uh, uh, my mistake if I describe mm -hmm. this diagram in that way certainly was not in, in intended in that way. Um, and going back to CO2, what I was thinking actually about CO2 is that you might have some orgasm processes that actually are producing uh, CO2. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think they were uh, considering that. Of course, when it comes to nitrogen, uh, well, uh, we're even struggling to understand the, uh, the amount of nitrogen that we have uh, in the solar system for the terrestrial planet. So of course, uh, That's actually an unsolved problem. We don't know yeah. why the Earth has the amount of nitrogen that mm -hmm. it has. Of course, it's not, in many instances, it's somewhat inert, but uh, that's part of the puzzle of how it got here. So, in fact, the, uh, we have many questions, really, and uh, uh, one of the questions is uh, the elemental composition that we potentially can uh, measure in uh, exoplanetary atmosphere can tell us something about uh, uh, the formation process of the planet. So where in the disk the planet was formed and how potentially it migrated to other parts of the disk. And uh, there are some papers out that seem to, su to suggest that indeed it might be the case. Uh, in particular, it has been looked at uh, uh, elemental <coughs> ratio like carbon over oxygen and uh, 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 in the simulation that uh, uh, some team uh, uh, made, uh, basically, depending where you're forming the planet, so at what distance from the planet, of course, your ice line will change. And so depending uh, where you're forming the planet compared to this ice line, it will have uh, more carbon or more oxygen. And then, of course, this, this ratio is a sort of initial condition um, for the planet. And so potentially, by measuring the carbon uh, uh, versus oxygen ratio in the atmosphere, you might get some understanding of the formation process. And of course, these are, this is just an example. In theory, you can do this uh, uh, with other elements, uh, nitrogen or, or sulfur. Um, then, of course, there is the question, how do planets evolve? And uh, uh, talking about the evolution, the I mentioned many processes that potentially can trigger the evolution of this uh, planetary atmosphere from, uh, um, from a chemical perspective. Uh, if we are considering um, equilibrium chemistry or non-equilibrium chemistry, and I, swear I will spend a few words about uh, uh, these, two, um, uh, these two things uh, in a bit, but 
in any case, uh, uh, we are not modifying uh, the elemental composition. So, in a sense, uh, uh, one could speculate that the elemental composition is really linked to the initial condition at the time of formation, and then possibly is sort of uh, uh, frozen unless uh, some species are lost uh, uh, from the atmosphere. So, I mentioned equilibrium chemistry. What do I mean by equilibrium chemistry? Uh, at a particular temperature, uh, some uh, uh, molecule, uh, uh, in particular if we're considering carbon-bearing molecule, um, depending on the temperature, uh, I have uh, basically a, a carbon being present, uh, more preferably uh, in uh, methane or a CO form, and uh, the amount of methane and the amount of CO, according to equilibrium chemistry, really increases or decreases. And the same thing happens, for instance, for molecular nitrogen and ammonia, and so on and so forth. So equilibrium chemistry uh, tells you that the temperature sort and pressure dictates uh, uh, what is the uh, most favorable species um, for that particular element. But of course, things are, are much more complicated than this. Um, and actually, before I get to the uh, complication, uh, not only uh, in equilibrium chemistry, in theory, you have one species that is uh, a more favorite compared to others, depending on the temperature and the pressure, uh, but also at different temperature and pressure, you are basically having uh, some phase transitions. And so in particular, uh, what I'm showing you here in this diagram is a, a condensate that can uh, um, occur in the atmosphere of Jupiter, so a colder type of atmosphere. So as you can see, there are many, many condensates. Uh, then uh, T-dwarf, uh, uh, definitely hotter, and the number of condensates is less, and uh, is uh, uh, less and less when we go from L-dwarf to M-dwarf. And so, uh, uh, clearly, the hotter is the atmosphere, uh, the less uh, uh, condensates I have in the atmosphere, and the more even uh, uh, high Z element can be present uh, in a um, volatile form, and so basically be seen in the atmosphere. So I mentioned that uh, equilibrium chemistry um, is a simplification. Why is the case? Well, because actually there are many processes uh, that can uh, trigger um, some uh, um, non-equilibrium type of chemistry. Um, normally, when you look at, uh, at a, particular, uh, um, a particular molecule, a particular element, uh, you need, uh, in order to understand what's going on um, uh, at the non-equilibrium, you need to solve uh, basically some mass continuity equation, what I'm looking at here. This is the derivative of my species n with respect to time. This is a term that gives me the flux. And uh, in theory, the flux should be given by the um, ni, uh, so basically uh, concentration of my species ni, multiply the velocity, and the velocity should be given by the dynamics. But of course, this is quite uh, complicated to, um, uh, to estimate the velocity from the dynamics. And so normally, one uses a, a, a sort of approximation, which is this one, uh, where basically we have uh, two diffusion terms, um, one that is more a molecular sort of diffusion, and another one that is an uh, eddy diffusion, uh, that are sort of uh, substituting the um, uh, the, uh, the the term with the with the flux, and then of course uh, if uh, there is a derivative with respect to time of the species, uh, so basically uh, 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 a change in time of the concentration is due to either uh, um, uh, some reaction, some chemical reaction where the species is produced uh, uh, minus uh, some chemical uh, minus basically when the species is. Uh, um, uh, is on the contrary um, uh, deleted because of some uh, uh, um, uh, um, reaction rates that on the contrary are destroying this particular um, species. 
So non-equilibrium chemistry becomes uh, certainly very important in the upper part of the atmosphere when it's triggered by photochemistry and so interaction with the star. Um, and in particular, I'm showing sure you some example. On Titan, uh, you have some photochemical ases uh, which are produced by the photolysis of methane in the upper atmosphere. And the photolysis of methane uh, uh, then uh, causes the production of some a long chain of uh, higher hydrocarbon um, and long chain of carbons in the atmosphere. Or even the clouds on Venus are sort of triggered by photochemical uh, reactions. And so clearly this reaction or uh, certainly non-equilibrium sort of chemistry. Um, but other non-equilibrium uh, type of chemistry can occur when, for instance, uh, the uh, time scale of the dynamics is much faster compared to the time scale of the chemistry. So if you don't uh, leave the chemistry to uh, get to the equilibrium and the dynamics is basically um, uh, sort of bringing away uh, the, the, the species that uh, are reacting, then you can sort of quench in some species in the atmosphere uh, through this uh, process. So. Um, Models have been uh, produced for the atmospheres in particular, or the hot Jupiters, and uh, uh, the teams that are doing this kind of work seem to suggest that for uh, uh, temperature which, is which are higher than 1,500 Kelvin, then uh, possibly equilibrium chemistry should uh, dominate, whereas uh, for colder atmosphere, uh, non-equilibrium chemistry should be uh, quite important. And of course, we need to have observation in order to um, confirm or not uh, what, uh, what I just said. Uh, but of course, to confirm it, we need to be able not just to derive uh, uh, the concentration um, of this molecule in the atmosphere with relatively high precision, but in some cases also maybe have some hints uh, about uh, the concentration as a function of altitudes, not just as, a, as an average. And of course, uh, current observation are not really yet there to tell us what is going on. But uh, with better observation, hopefully, we are able uh, uh, to start distinguish uh, whether we are in an equilibrium regime or a non-equilibrium regime, and so um, uh, what is the uh, situation for the planet. The very good thing <coughs> about uh, uh, hot planets and so extrasolar planets in general, uh, and then referring in particular to the giant planet, is that uh, given these atmosphere uh, are very hot, uh, uh, basically we can potentially probe elemental composition of elements like oxygen or carbon or nitrogen and sulfur uh, by looking at the volatile speci species in the atmosphere. And this is again because at hot temperature, uh, typically uh, their main molecular carrier do not condense. As I showed you before, the hotter is the temperature, uh, the uh, less uh, species are actually condensing in the atmosphere. And so certainly this is not the case for the giant planets in our own solar system. As it was said in our lectures, uh, we still don't know the uh, amount of water and therefore of oxygen in the Jupiter atmosphere because it's just uh, too deep in the atmosphere. But potentially, with exosolar planet, we're able to probe this elemental composition uh, because we don't have this problem. And uh, um, in, in, uh, in principle, uh, we are able to derive this elemental composition uh, 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 quite accurately because we can easily probe species like water vapor, uh, CO2, CH4, uh, ammonia, and work out then uh, the um, elemental ratio uh, uh, between uh, this molecule and possibly uh, again link this uh, to the formation evolution processes. I have uh, just 10 minutes left and so I will quickly wrap up a bit just to say that uh, uh, I think what we can uh, hope for the future is really a push observation to get to this sort of precision where we can start to probe elemental composition and then have a clue about uh, formation and evolution processes. Uh, of course, ideally, but uh, we're talking about uh, really a, um, a dream uh, sort of uh, 
uh, situation, uh, we would like to also look at the isotopic ratio, and uh, these are certainly revealed uh, extremely useful for the solar system. Uh, the D over H ratio uh, on Mars uh, is, is telling us that uh, clearly uh, uh, is, well, this, this ratio is five times the one on Earth, and so is really suggestive of a very evolved type of atmosphere that uh, presumably has uh, lost uh, in time uh, um, uh, because of the smaller size of the planet. Uh, and this uh, 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 D over H ratio is also very high on Venus, um, uh, possibly uh, losing a, a high amount of water. Um, certainly this ratio is really very, very high compared to the one on Earth. Looking at, in general, at this uh, isotopic value, uh, D over H, um, uh, for the Earth or the protosolar, um, and then uh, uh, our satellites uh, or our um, uh, meteorites, uh, then it's quite interesting to see that uh, the D over H uh, uh, value is quite different uh, uh, for the Earth, it's quite different from the one of the protosolar, um, but is actually quite similar to uh, some uh, chondrites. Uh, again, this uh, it could be suggestive of the fact uh, that uh, these were the principal source of uh, Earth's volatile. And a very similar conclusion can be, um, uh, um, can be uh, found actually for nitrogen. And what we're looking at here is actually um, the isotopic ratio for nitrogen. Um, and also in this particular case, uh, the value for the Earth uh, is uh, quite similar to the one of the uh, chondrites. My very last slide, I told you that uh, um, life can uh, dramatically change the composition of a planet. And uh, the only example I can show you is the one on Earth, because we don't know other uh, planets for the moment that are habitable. Um, but the case for the Earth is, uh, is, is really uh, extremely interesting because uh, uh, life appeared on Earth about uh, 3.8 uh, uh, billion years ago and uh, at the beginning uh, uh, prokaryotes we really try every sort of metabolism and then at a certain point, boom, they discovered oxygen. Uh, very efficient metabolic uh, species and uh, the amount of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere is uh, really strictly correlated with the increase of complexity. Um, and uh, again, without life, we wouldn't have all this oxygen today. 21% of the Earth's atmosphere is uh, 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 today uh, um, occupied by, by oxygen, and it wouldn't be so if it weren't for life. And so this tells us that uh, if some of our planets are habitable, then we should probably expect some atmosphere which are also dramatically changed like the one left. Okay, I better stop here and take questions. So the only dust formation mechanism that you mentioned is condensation in the protoplanetary uh, disk. But uh, some dust can also be formed in the solar, in the um, stellar wind. So how does it compare? How much dust? What's the um, ratio between the amount of dust produced in each way? Well, dust is everywhere. So uh, um, uh, it's, it's fair to say that it's really uh, quite ubiquitous. Uh, but I was mentioning dust in particular in the case of molecular clouds because without dust it would be uh, very difficult to imagine uh, the formation of these very complex molecules and so I mentioned in particular dust in that particular case because it has a key role in uh, triggering the formation of these long chain molecules. So that's why I focus on that. But this is not to say that, I mean, dust, as I said, is, is really everywhere. So it's, it's not really just the molecular clouds. I think the important issue there is whether the, the um, <coughs> when you're talking about the solar nebula, how much, <coughs> how much of the material is inherited from the interstellar medium. I mean, clearly all the, nearly all the heavy elements are delivered as dust, but of course they can be reprocessed. And this is the issue. 
how much of it gets reprocessed, how much of it survives. We know of material in meteorites that survived delivery to the solar system, although it appears to be only a small amount, silicon carbide grains that are isotopically anomalous. They don't look like anything else in the solar system. So <coughs> we think they came from the interstellar medium. But a lot of other stuff arrived as dust, got evaporated, and then recondensed. In the outer solar system, that would naturally be true for the ISIS. Uh, for the silicates, one presumes in many cases it survives, but then when it gets into meteorite parent bodies, it gets processed again, could be busted up. Um, and so I, I, I think that's a very interesting issue. It's is interesting not just for the chemistry, but also because, um, as we discussed earlier in the school, uh, the question of dust opacity matters for the formation of giant planets. And in the history of that subject, it was assumed that it was the interstellar medium that told us the opacity. It's not at all clear that that's true. Um, coming back to uh, H2D ratio, uh, basically what I noticed that, well, basically you mentioned, you said that the five times the ratio is very large difference, uh, but in principle, I don't think it's that large when you comparing to that it's, it's within the error bars of some measurements, so it, it's not that, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's considered to be a very large differences, but in some cases, five times or twice in, in such cases is kind of small number, I would say. Yeah, but in, uh, relatively speaking, I mean, it's different, the one on Earth from the photosolar. No, it, it wasn't a question. Sorry. <laughs> um, how fast is this um, transition from an oxygen poor atmosphere to an oxygen rich atmosphere? And would it be an indication for life if we, w if we would <coughs> observe a high fraction of oxygen in an in a exoplanet atmosphere? Or well, uh, on Earth, uh, actually, it's uh, as you can see, uh, it, it's very rapid because, in a sense, uh, it's taking. Um, relatively little time, relatively of course, uh, as soon as life has understood that oxygen was the way to go, uh, it really took advantage of it. Whether one can uh, sort of generalize uh, uh, the use of oxygen or ozone, which is connected to, to oxygen as a biosignature, then I would be more careful. Um, uh, I think it is fair to say that uh, in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, molecular oxygen is completely out of equilibrium, and so it needs to have a constant source to resupply this amount, and in the case of the Earth, is life. But I think wherever we can generalize this statement uh, to our planet, so then uh, I personally would be a bit more cautious. But, but could it be rapid enough to observe a change in an atmosphere uh, around an exoplanet? Sorry? Could the process be fast enough to exchange over, I don't know, how many years a, a, an increase in oxygen in an atmosphere? Well, so you're saying whether we can detect an increase of oxygen in an exoplanet? Well, that seems to be really in the future. I mean, I would be already very, very happy if we can detect uh, some, some oxygen in an atmosphere, a detected increase of oxygen, then yeah, uh, it seems to be uh, a bit, <laughs> a bit, yeah, what <laughs> a bit difficult. <laughs> Yeah. Well, this, uh, I mean, this kind of measurements uh, are, um, are taking, looking at the, some rocks and how they oxidize uh, some rocks in the surface. So is that uh, estimated this time scale? Uh, yeah. So, it? well, it will be, I mean, you're talking about still a uh, uh, million years or so. I mean, it's not really so small amount. Uh, in, in the overall lifetime of the Earth, is relatively rapid, but still. I think it uh, has to be exponential in the lifetime of the organisms. That they, they multiply the, the exponential rate, so this, is, this sets it the same scale. Uh, that's a good point. That's a very short comment. Uh, comment. So the, about oxygen isotopes. O18 to O16 is an important proxy of the previous ancient temperatures. So another aspect of the... Generally, the isotopic part 
can be of quite importance and the other CD 13 to 12 in there. Then the, about the um, radiation, which you remark. Every time you see this radiation, generally it means that electrons have to be accelerated. And the processes of the acceleration is another topic important in the investigation. And then the last thing which I wanted to say is that also charged states, according to Saha and other equations, is also a um, proxy of temperatures in some something. And I think that we didn't take we didn't talk too much about the this aspect of the charge states of different things. The isotope charge states and many other Pandora boxes. I mean, for exoplanets, I would really like to stress that isotopes should be really, really, really in the future. I mean, I don't think I can, for the moment, see any uh, uh, future mission being able really to get to the isotope ratio. But again, <coughs> ideally, uh, one day we might get there. Um, just on, the, on how, how fast um, an atmosphere could, could have a second. Well, I don't know. I don't think that anybody really knows. <laughs> but I would be just very, very happy to uh, detect such a concentration of oxygen in, in a planet without uh, even thinking about uh, detecting an increase uh, in that concentration. Um, I think, I mean, to me, it looks pretty steep. Seems to really to suggest that the life found the right combination with oxygen as a uh, metabolic reactant and the use of photosynthesis to get energy to cause the cycle, um, and so really be able to get to complexity. Well, I came I came across some papers talking about the uh, false positive of uh, in in. Uh, oxygen observation. Can you comment a little bit about it and the solutions? Yes, there are, there are many papers out uh, that uh, are uh, 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 suggesting some uh, possible false positive. So basically, amount of oxygen that uh, or ozone that can be produced uh, in an abiotic way. And yes, of course, uh, this is one of the caveats that we need to have. That's why I'm personally very cautious. Um, whether it's true that then. Uh, uh, these processes are um, are quite effective, and so uh, indeed, if we see some oxygen, uh, uh, it's uh, due to life or uh, not due to life. Again, we, we're missing an experiment here. Uh, we're, we're really speculating at this point. Um, I think personally, I think that we need to see many, many potentially habitable planets and many planets which are not habitable at all. Understand a bit better the um, the uh, uh, the number of possibilities out there, and then uh, maybe we can figure out uh, after having seen a, a population of objects uh, what is uh, most probable and what is not. And today uh, we have just no clue about this from observational point of view. Uh, did you say this was the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere or in present throughout the whole history of Earth? In the atmosphere or? Um, because we know life started in the ocean, and actually if you looked at Earth, you wouldn't see the majority of oxygen being produced by life from the very beginning, because uh, oxygen doesn't leave the ocean very efficiently from the water to the atmosphere. So if you were looking for life on Earth, while well, life existed for billions of years, you actually wouldn't be able to find it. So it's been argued oxygen is a pretty poor tracer of life in that regard. Well, uh, here we're talking about concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere, and the reason why I'm talking about the atmosphere is because, uh, uh, again, uh, this was these measurements were done by looking at some iron oxide or absence of it on the surface. And so the surface uh, um, was connected to the atmosphere, and so that's why we have this information. Uh, yeah, you, you were both saying that the picture of Forja and Leconte might be too simplistic. So, what what would be the minimum amount of parameters to add to have a more realistic picture of what's happening? I think we need to personally. I think we need to start really observing many objects and understand their complexity. Even in the solar system, uh, uh, there there are so many intricacies. 
uh, that uh, seems to be quite unique to each planet so that one really wonder where one can really summarize everything in, in a diagram. Um, even just on Mars and Venus, uh, in theory, CO2 should not be there in that amount. Uh, carbon should be more uh, 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 contained in CO rather than CO2, um, but it's stable in CO2 because in one case, in the case of Mars, there's a little bit of water that is triggering a series of reactions. In the case of Venus, there, there is some chlorine that is triggering some reaction. And this sort of suggests that that's, uh, we really need to be very careful when we generalize. I, I agree with, uh, with David on this. Just to elaborate slightly, um, you know, the amount of water on Earth is one part per thousand by mass. We have no understanding in a more general context of why it's that number, right? I mean, it could easily be a hundred times more or a hundred times less, depending on the story that you had for how water is delivered. We don't think water condensed in the environment that most of the Earth material condensed. We think that stuff came from elsewhere. Standard story is from planetesimals out near Jupiter. But that's a story specific to our solar system. And that should tell you that when thinking about the so-called Earth-like planets, I hate the phrase, but people use it, Earth-like planets and other planetary systems, that you have no right to expect even to an order of magnitude the same amount of water because it's a hugely variable thing. Uh, one more comment. A fascinating coincidence for the Earth is that we have both oceans and dry land. Think about that. That's an astonishing coincidence because the parameter that tells you the depth of the oceans is a statement about how much water is delivered. The parameter that tells you whether or not you have dry land as well is a statement about little g and about the strength of materials. Uh, that is, and, and also in the case of the Earth, the thickness of the continental crust, which is a differentiate. So it involves completely different considerations, and yet we have the coincidence that we live on a planet that has both oceans and dry land. Just, just to amplify that, one of the biggest, possibly the biggest reservoir of water we have in the solar system is the comet cloud. And the properties of the comet cloud are extremely sensitive to the detailed geometry of an architecture of the particular system from which it formed. So you could easily have comet clouds that were a factor of 10 more massive or a factor of 1,000 less massive. Okay. Let us thank Giovanna again. Thanks.